Murder in the Rain, Portland's favorite Pacific Northwest true crime podcast, will be performing live on June 24th, 2023. Join us for a night of true crime stories at Portland, Oregon's beautiful Revolution Hall. Tickets are on sale now at revolutionhall.com and at murderintherain.com. Spring cleaning and organizing your space isn't the only way to get a fresh start this season. This spring, take care of your mental health at ForHers.com. At ForHers.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medication if it's right for you. The process is 100% online, including unlimited check-ins, provider messaging, and support along the way. Plus, to make things even simpler, you can get your first month of treatment for just $25 if prescribed. To get started, go to ForHers.com slash spring. That's ForHers.com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. Look, I know that for some people, getting access to the proper mental health care can be a source of stress in and of itself. That's why HERS makes it so simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash spring. That's F-O-R-H-E-R-S dot com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. Offer only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Subscription required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. HERS, mental health care for real life. is hard. This isn't news. But what might be news is that you can now send beer, wine, and spirits right to your friends and family with Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. Which is good news because adult beverages are the only gift that no one ever returns. And Drizzly's tailored experience lets you find the perfect drink for the occasion, no matter what it is. You'll save time by shopping a huge selection of drinks from wherever you are. You'll save money by comparing prices on said drinks across stores. And you'll get to spend more time sipping with your giftees. You know, if they're the sharing type. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. The Portland metro area has always been the quirky girl of American cities. We partake in anything usually deemed weird or out of the norm, and we like it that way. However, that weirdness can often be perceived as a gateway to even more strange and who knows, maybe even dangerous lifestyles. So when a young mother in Gresham called 911 after being attacked, her life was dissected and detectives thought they may have uncovered the role the evildoer played in her life. That role was of a pirate. Today, I'll be telling you the story of Anastasia Hester of Gresham, Oregon, and how her killer was closer than detectives ever imagined. How can I help you? I'm sorry, Do you need an ambulance? What happened? I don't know, but I'm sorry. Somebody's trying to Where is this person at now? I'm not here. Do you know the name of the person that did this to you? No. Are you bleeding a lot? It was one minute before 3 a.m. on Friday, June 10th, 2016. You just heard an emergency dispatcher speaking with 34-year-old Anastasia Diane Holmes. Her married name was Hester, though, and it hadn't been changed back after her divorce in 2012. To friends, she went by Anne. To Dateline, she went by Annie. To the dispatcher, she was simply Ma'am, who was bleeding to death. 
Paramedics arrived at the apartment in the East Park complex around the 100 block of Eastman Parkway at six minutes after three. From Anne's condition, response, and obvious loss of blood, they knew they couldn't waste any time trying to help her at the scene, so they immediately loaded her into the ambulance and took her to the hospital. Detectives were called in to process the scene of the attack and to try to figure out what had led to it. Upon arrival, two things were shocking to see. First, the devastating amount of blood. It was everywhere, on bedding, on the walls, soaking the carpet. Then they saw objects around the house and a bedroom that were all clearly meant for a child, but there wasn't one at the scene. That gives me icky vibes. Yeah. Concerns arose that this whole incident may have been an attack on a mother with the goal of kidnapping the little girl. Officers were immediately assigned the task of finding out the identity of the child they were looking for. Just half an hour after she was taken to the hospital, Anastasia was declared dead. Her home was already being processed as a crime scene, and now it would be treated as the scene of a homicide. Before detectives could learn about the woman who had been killed, they needed to try and put the pieces together as to what happened. Going through the house, they noted that Anne had given her young daughter Alice the only bedroom of the apartment. Anne set up a bedroom space for herself in the living room with a pull-out couch for a bed, a bed that was now disheveled and covered in blood. On the bloody carpet next to the bed lay what officers believed were the murder weapons. Unusual for an attack of this kind, they were surprised to find three knives of varying sizes. Hoping to find fingerprints or DNA, they were collected and sent in for testing. At the front door, the linoleum tiles were painted with blood. A second attack had taken place at the door. Getting lucky again, a bloody shoe print was discovered on the tile. It, too, was collected. Exploring the exterior of Anne's ground floor apartment, detectives found what they believed to have been the point of entry. A cinder block had been moved or perhaps even brought to the scene by the perpetrator. It was placed under the window outside the little girl's room. Standing on the block, the killer was able to remove the window unit air conditioner and slide the window open, giving them access to the home. The means of entry had detectives and the community at a loss. It appeared to be a random attack someone just entering the complex, climbing the back fence, and by random luck, choosing the first ground floor apartment they came across and climbed inside. But the intensity of the attack had the appearance of passion and overkill, which would negate the idea of it being random. The first area searched was across the street from the apartment complex. On the other side of Eastman Parkway was the Springwater Trail. The trail extends 21 miles from Boring, which is east of Gresham, to the east bank of the Willamette River, looking over to downtown Portland. It's used for walking, hiking, biking, and unfortunately as a home for many transients and houseless folks, which has led to physical attacks and drug issues along the trail. Thinking someone from the trail could have made their way across the street to the apartments, the surrounding area was searched, but no evidence of a bloody perpetrator leaving the apartment and returning to that area was found. Robbery was also fairly quickly dismissed as a motive. The apartment was a bit cluttered and messy, but nothing a robber would traditionally take, like a TV, phone, wallet, or money, were missing. By the following morning, the team assigned to finding the little girl who lived in the home was relieved to learn she had been in custody of her father, Matthew. Matt only had his daughter, Alice, on certain weekends, and thankfully, this had been his scheduled time, and he had picked her up from school the day before. She was never in harm's way, nor did she have to witness her mother's brutal killing. That's a relief. Yeah, on many levels. Matthew Hester and Anne started dating back in 2006. The pair shared a love for all things gaming and had actually met at a local coffee shop called Interzone. The one that they met at in Gresham has since closed, but there is a Corvallis location that remains open, or at least there's a cafe with the same name. No, it's there. I think it's the same. I uh, rem- is it the same? I it's remember like, it well. And it's game themed basically oh you know what maybe not okay well i'm not sure i couldn't find a formal connection it was just the same name in a coffee house so yeah, i'm not I think, sure i think it might just be the name now that i think about it but. so at the one in gresham it was a coffee shop slash arcade slash gaming area and the pair would happily pass time by playing games like magic the gathering and dungeons and dragons anastasia was born october 26th 1981 She lived with both of her parents until their divorce when she was still young. She would end up living with her mom, stepfather, and stepbrother, all of whom she was quite close to. But she didn't have much of a relationship with her father, as he died when she was just a teenager. She would go on to graduate high school and complete some college before meeting Matt. 
At the time of their meeting, she was working at an after-school program where she had become a supervisor. When they met at the gaming cafe, she already had a love for all things fantasy and escape. Matt's fondness was for anything related to games. Board games were great, but he especially loved video games. Falling in love, they were married in 2008. According to some of Anne's friends, there was love between the couple, but Anne was well aware that becoming Matt's second wife wasn't an ideal situation. The relationship wasn't perfect, and they had serious issues early on. Anne loved working with kids, and an important goal of hers was to have a family of her own, which included having children. So if she needed to settle with someone as apathetic as Matt, she was willing to do so if it meant getting the child she wanted. After three years of marriage, the couple welcomed their daughter Alice in 2011. Anne loved being a mother even more than she had expected to. She wanted nothing but peace and joy for her daughter. She also realized bringing a baby into her marriage affected the dynamic. She and Matt started to drift apart even more. Not wanting to follow in her parents' footsteps, she did not want a divorce, so she came up with an idea that she hoped would help. Polyamory has become a popular phrase in America's lexicon of late, Within the last few years, it seems like it's not just on dating apps or something a couple of your friends do. Well, maybe that's only if you're in the Pacific Northwest. But now the relationship style is being represented in TV characters and on reality shows, as those who participate are feeling safe enough to be open about their relationship choices. Like the show New Amsterdam that I've been watching. Well, there you go. Is there a polyamorous group? There sure is. Group or couple? Yeah. (gasps) Wow. Em, do you have anyone in your life that is living that life? That you know? Um, not anyone close to me. I do know. I, I used to have a colleague who I found out when I joined. Oh, that's apps, right. I, I remember that. <laughs> um, and then I think there's like, you know, acquaintances here and yeah. there that have tried it, but I don't think anyone's like stuck with it long term. For those unfamiliar with the practice or even the definition, polyamory is best described as ethical non-monogamy, as in you have a main partner, perhaps even a spouse, and yourself or both partners are aware of other partners you are dating and or sleeping with. This isn't bigamy as in one person is trying to marry as many people as possible, although marriage ceremonies between poly couples do occur. Nor is it promoting a damaging lifestyle like seeking sister wife. It's just everyday people like Anne. People who maybe don't want their marriage to end because there is still love or a connection there, but they feel lacking aspects could be found not with that partner, but with someone else. Or perhaps the situation is that you have a partner that doesn't want to participate in sex the same way you'd like. Maybe someone struggles with monogamy, and this can be a great way to have everyone's needs met. Just like every monogamous relationship is different, the same goes for polyamory. According to a 2021 study, about 5% of Americans participate in this practice. However, the Portland Mercury just released their annual sex survey results, and that number is, not surprisingly, just a smidge higher among the filthy liberals that responded. How much higher are we talking? Uh, 24% of the respondents (laughs) said that their relationship was either flexible or open. Here? 24? Now, that's only the people that responded, so this is... Yeah, they're probably more likely to share their personal life. Yeah, the the Mercury is a very liberal, very left Wow. See, that's higher than I would ever... I would think maybe 10% of Portlanders. As someone who was online dating for a while this is not a surprising number (laughs) wow that is that is now the the question is in the people in their relationship know that too (laughs) right yeah no kidding yeah is this is this everybody involved (laughs) and you know if you think about it it is possible that number is the same in other places like kentucky or tennessee or something but they just can't be open about it like most things it's possible so that was what Anne presented Not just for Matt, but for both of them. They could find other partners with one caveat. She needed him to be open and honest about it, and she would do the same. You know, that whole ethical part. So no sneaking around. To meet Anne's needs, Matt would simply need to say who he was meeting up with and to make it clear he was dating that person. Matt agreed to Anne's request. You would think being given permission from your wife to seek company with others would be cool enough that you would be able to not break her one rule but not Matt, whose first marriage also ended due to his infidelity. After Anne learned of the several affairs he had not disclosed, she became rightfully upset with the disrespect, and with no other avenues to pursue, she filed for divorce in 2012. 
That's interesting that someone would choose to hide it and lie about it when you're giving given the opportunity it makes no to sense. not like so that's clearly what they like about it is the secret. Yeah. And uh, I think you'll find with this guy the apathy and the lack of effort. I don't even know that he was trying to be sneaky. I think it was like the incapability to be like, oh, yeah, I should tell her that. Hmm. This wasn't an easy decision for Anne to make as it left her a single mother of a little girl, but it was a challenge she was up for. She loved being a mom and watching her little girl grow. Moving into the one-bedroom apartment in Gresham, Anne happily turned the only room into Alice's. Up went the purple and pink decorations, toys and stuffed animals were strewn about. To bring in additional income while indulging in her childlike imagination, Anne and her best friends started a face-painting business and it went fairly well. They worked birthday parties and other special events on the weekends that Alice was with Matt. Anne was happy to be working beside her best friend while having fun and making money. When they split, Anne and Matt created a schedule that worked best for them. He would get Alice on the weekends, and I never saw if it was every weekend or not, but it sounded more like maybe every other weekend, and Alice would live full-time with Anne as the main parent. Could you imagine... What kind of scumbag parent would only want to see their child or children for something like four days out of the month? Sounds like neglect to me. Matt may not have been the best husband, but he was known to everyone who saw him with Alice for being a good father. Even though Matt and Anne's relationship hadn't ended or started, for that matter, on the best terms, the pair co-parented with ease. Exchanges took place at school, leaving communication and interactions to a minimum. To pay her bills, Anne started working at a call center in downtown Portland, where she had the grueling task of completing medical surveys over the phone. She became so good at her job, she was quickly promoted to be the trainer of new hires. She was happy to do what it took to give Alice everything she needed, because it wasn't like the measly $200 Matt was paying in monthly child support was going to be of much help. Anne had gotten herself a decent job to pay for things. To pay his bills, Matt, who had always struggled to hold on to a job due to his love of video games, decided to go the roommate route. That's when he met Angela McCraw, also a single mother, and she moved into his home near 122nd and the Springwater Trail. Uh, To clarify, she and her three young children moved into the house. Oh, dear. No thanks. Like Matt, Angela had been married twice before, her oldest daughter coming from her first marriage, There wasn't much to say about that relationship. Angela had only implied to her daughter, Emily, that that man had been abusive. Leaving him, she then met Aaron McCraw. They wed and had two sons. Around the same time Matt and Anne were breaking up in 2012, Angela and Aaron were doing the same. Though they started as just roommates, it took less than a month for Matt and Angela to start dating. Oh, boy. And I don't know how much dating you're doing with three kids in the house and already it's living called together. It's nighttime boning. <laughs> yeah. It's not dating. Pretty much. It's just convenient. Yeah. The couple was married in 2014. Anne had no feelings about it. The former couple was barely in any contact unless it related to Alice. Anne had moved on with her life and was not concerning herself with her ex. The relationship did seem to make Matt a more engaged father. He was trying to spend more time with Alice And now that he had three kids in the home who were now his stepchildren, he was appearing to be more ready for fatherhood. Not that things were easy. Angela's kids had been described as a handful. Not only were they very young, which is difficult enough, but they all had disabilities and or illnesses of their own. Wow. With three kids and on some weekends four and two adults who didn't work, they were under serious financial strain. So more roommates joined them. An unnamed man had moved into the house. We'll refer to him as Daryl. Another man sort of lived there, but he had a girlfriend, so he just kind of came and went. We'll call that man Aaron McCraw, because that's who it was. That's Angela's ex-husband. What Mm. in the world? Maybe it was helpful to have the children's father living with them. But yeah, it does seem like it would be very difficult. I mean... I know I've lived with an ex because of housing issues, but to have to live with your ex-wife and your children and her new husband, that would be a lot. Then there was Corinne, Angela's best friend. She, too, was a victim of a divorce, a lost job, and unaffordable housing, leading to her eventually ending up on the street. There wasn't much room left in the house, but Corinne moved in, creating a bedroom space for herself in the garage, something I definitely did in high school, and I had friends that did it in college, 
It's not ideal or the warmest, but it's better than nothing. What kind of house was this? Like how big I, it was this It didn't appear. I couldn't find the exact, but it looked like not massive. Like but a four bedroom, three bedroom? Like I don't even know if it was that many rooms. This is insane to me. Yeah. It looked like just an average suburban. Like I would never move in somewhere unless I knew I had my own room. Well, but if you're facing not having a job and Good can't point. pay for anything. I get bunk beds, I guess. Yeah, not ideal for anybody, I don't think. But I think efforts could have been made by some of the parties to remove themselves. The crime scene was being processed. Neighbors were being interviewed. Asking residents in the surrounding apartments, several claimed to have heard screaming or some sort of disturbance around 11.15 p.m. One neighbor said that they heard screaming and moaning as well. So they turned on a bathroom fan and their TV to drown out the noise. Around 3 a.m., another witness claimed to have heard two people yelling, a door slam, and a car leaving the area. Sadly, the only person to call for help was Anne herself, around 3 a.m., when she said the perpetrator had just left. In defense of the neighbors, it is very hard to know what is an issue and what is not. It's true. I've had some loud-ass neighbors, as you guys are well aware of, (laughs) and... You don't know what the heck's going on. You can't just call the cops every time they're loud. And right? it, and it's tricky because it's the dynamic of minding your business. Yeah. In the times I've lived in apartments, it's like you don't bother with anybody else's stuff. I, I yeah, I, I don't know what the takeaway is, except I feel it's like they there needs to be a code word to understand yeah. if somebody's really in need because you really you, you don't you can't understand what words are being saying half mm-hmm. the time said half the time. And that person probably felt horrible. If I learned later, like I oh, turned God, out my TV yeah. to cover up someone being murdered, that would be But I hope they don't feel guilty because it is really hard to know when someone's yeah. in need in that kind of scenario. Yeah. But and it's also like, well, what if I what if it's a domestic situation? I call it in and it makes and it worse. Nothing really happens or nothing legal happens. And then they find out it was me. And now I've created a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. And that is the struggle of those living in apartments all the time. Yeah. So I I totally get that. But it is harrowing to realize. And I think we've all had instances either in cases we've read or in our life where it's like, oh, yeah, it's just you. And unfortunately, it is, which sucks. Do you mean it's just you like you can only rely on yourself? Yeah. You know, I've been in public spaces where medical issues have gone down or safety issues have gone down and you look around and there's just eyes staring at you. People are scared too. There's entire classes at school dedicated to understanding the the human mind and why that happens. Yeah. Um, But like there are places where the government has designed it that you like in China, you don't help people because you could be prosecuted. You have to like pay the bill, right? If you help someone or something. Yeah, there's, yeah. I can't remember <laughs> yeah. the details. Something so like that. Yeah. Somebody knows, please share it. But I know there that there are places where you are basically just trained to be like that. Josh, what were we just watching that they were talking about? Don't pick up the phone? Oh, it was. It was don't pick up the phone. Because they were saying they'd done studies before where they were like, okay, you're going to ask this person on the other side a question. If they get it wrong, you're going to zap them. With, you're, you have to hit this button and it'll shock them. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that and study. The, and they push it. They're like, we're, you know, sorry, you got it wrong. And they tap it and the person's like screaming. And they've said like under authority, people will do horrible things. And so they were yeah. talking about the guy calling and forcing people to do the strip searches. And they were like, how can you be talked into that? And so they referenced that study. I think that's why I'm so fascinated with shows where you uh, have to form your own government, like, or books like Lord of the Flies. Oh, right. Because our minds are naturally predisposed to, like, wanting some sort of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I find it really interesting. Yeah. The information from the neighbors gave detectives a huge timeline of nearly four hours when the attack was taking place. Other detectives were hoping to get lucky with finding any kind of surveillance from the area. Now, just up the street from where Anne lived is the Gresham Town Fair Plaza. It's home to the Seasonal Spirit Store, America's Tire Company, where I got tires last week, (laughs) Dick's Sporting Goods, Ross, Joy Teriyaki, delicious, and Don Lattice, which is the best Mexican food in Gresham. And yes, I did just want to shout out Don Lattice because it is so good. But I also wanted to show that less than a mile from Anne was this busy intersection of Powell and Eastman Parkway and this huge shopping center. There were cameras all around. Getting closer to the complex, detectives found a neighbor who had a camera that was facing the complex, and it caught a vehicle on camera. Arriving at the apartment shortly after 11 p.m., the video showed a white Mazda SUV. 
The picture was too pixelated to get a license plate or to ID the driver. And as the detective said on one of the programs related to this case, this isn't a crime show where you can just enhance, enhance, enhance. It did, however, show them where and when the car came in. They then started the grueling task of tracing its path via cameras. That's always really interesting, though. Fascinating. That'd be so frustrating. It's tedious. Yeah, but I'm tedious sure is very. The word. Uh, once you get it put together, like they probably feel very accomplished. Yes. Now that Anne was deceased, Matt would need to be a full-time father to Alice. Before that could happen, he and Angela would need to be interviewed at the station. Taken into separate rooms, it was noted that both seemed to be suffering from something. Matt, only 35 years old, was nearly hunched over as he took painstaking steps across the room with the help of a walking cane. Detectives couldn't help but think that the limp was a ruse to show that he would have been physically incapable of attacking someone. When asked about the cane, Matt said he used it as he was suffering from an undiagnosed medical issue. That is interesting Mm -hmm. that the automatic automatically would think, oh, he's just trying Uh to look like he's not physically. Yeah, I'm weak. I'm sickly. I'm not strong. Yeah, I don't know where this case is going, but I'm into it. (laughs) Is this the video that we watched or that I saw? Uh He's like walking like he's using his hands. Yes. On table surfaces. Yeah. To like to like shift his legs over. It's yeah, it's and then. Well, you know. (laughs) Okay, I'll I'll learn soon, I think. Angela didn't have a cane, but she too was slouched, slow moving, and had her long stringy hair hanging in front of her face. The couple was then asked about their whereabouts on the night of Anne's murder. Matt seemed pretty straightforward. He had been at home with his wife and the kids. He picked Alice up from school earlier in the afternoon, and they all went home and played some video games. Around 10 p.m., the kids went to bed. He and Angela laid down in their bed and watched some TV before going to sleep themselves. And that's where he remained until the next morning. Then it was Angela's turn to answer the same question. Armed with the story Matt had given them, detectives assumed their accounts of that night would be pretty similar. They were wrong. Angela's version started out the same. They all hung out, put the kids to bed, went to bed, fell asleep watching Criminal Minds. When asked if Matt could have snuck out of bed, she shared that their bedroom, which, like Anne's, was in the living room, had their bed pushed up against the wall, and Matt slept on the wall side. Besides being a light sleeper, Angela would have been jostled awake if he had crawled over her or scooched to the end of the bed. When officers asked about Matt and Anne's relationship, Angela was the first to bring up the custody battle they had been engaged in. This hadn't been a simple disagreement about time shared, but a full-on bitter court battle. Angela started telling the officers that Anne wouldn't even let Alice talk to her father on the phone. That may sound extreme or petty, but as someone who has seen the emotional turmoil a phone call can cause to a child after speaking to a neglectful parent, I can understand why she wouldn't allow that. Angela continued, Unlike Matt, she shared an incident that had occurred in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. It was around 3 a.m. and one of her dogs needed to go out, so she got up to let it go potty. Standing up, she was suddenly overcome with feeling sick. Before she could get to the bathroom, she had thrown up all over herself and defecated at the same time. Wandering back to their bed, she woke Matt and asked him to help her get cleaned up. He did by undressing her and showering her. And not just a shower from the outside of the tub, but he got in with her to bathe her. Okay, wait, wait, wait. As people who are in a couple, is that normal? Because I never did that even when married. Well, knock on wood, I have never had a double-ended situation. So first and foremost, that. But I will say, post-surgery. Yeah, I guess you'd have to help a little there. There was some bathing. I've just never... Yeah, there was. <laughs> oh, boy. Sponge bath central. Yeah, as he sat in his little chair. I'm not cut out for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... I guess, I mean, I wouldn't say no Pretty much anyone that I knew, if you came up to me or Josh or my family, somebody was like, I'm sick and I need help being cleaned up, I would do that. I guess I'm just not that, I don't fall into that personality type category where Eh. I would ask for help when I'm all gross. Oh, yeah, probably not. That would take a lot for me to be like, help me get clean. I'd be on a deathbed. I'm more more likely to help someone than I am to ask for help. Oh, yeah. I've wiped a million butts. Who cares? A million, you say? Yes. I have an award for it. I'll show you. This story was immediately surprising to the detectives. Why would Matt say he slept all night when there was this whole bizarre puke shit shower incident? Maybe he thought she wouldn't remember it. 
Maybe. Because he poisoned her. <gasps> he gave her a sleeping pill. Before letting the couple go, the officers had one more question. After looking out to the parking lot, they couldn't help but notice that the couple had arrived in a white Mazda SUV, matching the exact style as the vehicle on the recording. Oh, here we go. Neither had a reason or excuse as to how that could have happened. They simply said no one left the house and no one borrowed their car, and it had to be nothing more than a coincidence. Matt even asked, how can I explain how something happened if I was asleep? When asked if detectives could look through their phones, both turned them over without hesitation. I like a, the whole, like, just cross your fingers and go with it. Right, yeah. It will work out. Or push back just a little. Well, I can you explain that? Yeah. Like, how far do you think you can get along in this? <sighs> oh, boy. Wait till you hear how far everybody thinks they can go. There wasn't anything they could be held on, so the couple was released. Although now they were being looked at by detectives as people of interest. Twelve hours later, they were brought back into the station for more questioning. Along with the couple, police were also speaking with the three roommates as they were potential witnesses. They first spoke with Angela's ex, Aaron McCraw. He had a solid alibi. He had been at his girlfriend's house that night. Daryl was also questioned, and he too had been out. When he came home around midnight, he felt he had seen both Angela and Matt in their living room bed together. Karina, the best friend, had two aspects to her account. Not only had she been up to use the bathroom sometime around 3 or 4 a.m., and she had seen the couple in bed and heard Angela snoring, but as I said before, her bedroom was in the garage. The only thing separating her from the noise outside was the garage door. On that alone, she probably would have heard the car leave, but she felt she would have definitely heard it because the car made a horrendous rattling screech. I would imagine something like a timing belt sound, you know, that high-pitched squee when it starts. So if someone had at any point in the night started that car, the screech would have startled her awake. When officers pushed, saying they weren't sure the woman would turn in her best friend, she was adamant. If she had known anything had happened or that they were involved, she would have said. Detectives also asked Karina about the couple's sex life. With the ex-husband around and both men having a penchant for infidelity, they wanted to know if the couple was into kinky stuff like group sex or multiple partners or anything along those lines. As far as she knew, they were not. Matt and Angela were also questioned. Angela spent most of the time with her head on the table. She was feeling even more ill than she had the day before. She told officers she was shocked when she was informed of Anne's death. Matthew was still limping in the second interview. He was also still adamant about not having any involvement. Testing the waters, the cops said that they had evidence that was proof that he did have something to do with it. Instead of arguing back that it wasn't possible or that they had the wrong guy, he said, if you had something, you would have charged me already. Ooh, that's, that's bold. Yeah, that's how you stay a person of interest, sir. <laughs> Letting the evidence lead them, detectives decided to look into Anne's life to see if there was anyone in it that may have wanted to harm her. That's when they learned she was not only still engaging in polyamory, but now there was a twist. She was a pirate. Oh, I forgot about the pirate component. <laughs> oh, how exciting. As I said, Portland is quirky. More importantly, we are, or at least those of us that aren't proud boy dicks, pretty darn open-minded. Now, it's not like we're the only city that has people who cosplay as pirates or have themed events, but we really embrace it. There's the Swashbucklers Ball, Portland Pirate Festival, Plunderthon, Pirate Bar Plunder and Karaoke, bands like the Pirettes, art spaces like Pirate Town, and many other pirate-related places and people. I also used to have an annual pirate party when I went to Oregon State. You sure did. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Anne had become part of that community after the divorce, and she had fallen in love with it. She would attend gatherings, fairs, and festivals, her purple hair matching the face paintings she would wear. She rocked the tricorn hat, the scarves, and coats. At some point, she had explored the kink subsect of the pirate community, but after some light knife play, she realized that that was not for her. Some may think that role-playing or dancing around with friends in costumes is goofy or immature, but, you know, who are we to judge? Our inner child is still in there, and there's no harm in acknowledging them and treating them to some childlike fun. And fun was exactly what Anne was having. She was meeting people, making friends, and she even started a new relationship. Within the pirate community, she had met James Morgenstern. He loved Anne's caring nature and bright smile. So did his wife, Brianne. 
Soon, Anne was dating both James and Brianne. At the time, the couple was engaged, they've since married, and the three of them respected each other's relationship boundaries, and they seemed to be balancing it all fairly well. Brianne was so smitten with Anne, she saw herself having a marriage ceremony with her someday. Besides being confusing or flat-out foreign to investigators, the thruple made detectives think the motive for killing Anne was hidden within their dynamic. Had one lover become jealous of another? Would Anne being out of the picture ease their frustrations? Were there additional relationships that were envious of Anne, Brianne, and James? Or maybe there was a bad breakup? As for the pirate aspect, detectives couldn't help but picture the knives that were not all that dissimilar from those that had been used on Anne as being like those worn and used by pirates and pirate cosplayers. Side note, on Dateline, they stated that the thruple had broken up six weeks before Anne's murder. On Snapped, though, the couple was actually interviewed and they did not make any statement about having broken up or anything of the like. So I'm going to go with what they said since they were there. Digging deeper into Anne's personal and pirate life, detectives found no evidence of a relationship souring or another party being involved. It was clear James and Brianne were devastated by the loss of their loved one. As for an alibi, James had been in the hospital recovering from knee surgery the night Anne was murdered, and Brianne had been at his side. So he really had a reason to walk weird if anyone was going to walk weird. (laughs) (laughs) This left detectives wondering. If her partners were cleared, was there anyone else in her orbit that would have wished her harm? When that same question was presented to Brianne and James, they both had the same answer. Matt and Angela. The couple, being supportive of Anne, had been with her through the custody issues. They knew just how ugly things had become between Alice's parents. James especially was able to illuminate the situation for the detectives. It was just weeks before Anne's death that a judge ruled the custody of Alice would remain as it had been since the divorce. Anne would have full custody, Matt would have scheduled weekends. Part of that ruling involved financial restitution. Matt would need to pay the $29,000 in lawyer fees. On top of that, he owed the back child support he hadn't been paying, which came out to be $13,000. He hadn't been paying $200 a month? I think that the $200 a month was what maybe they agreed on and then once it went to court they were like well actually what it should be is this much i see and that left matt at a loss as to where he would suddenly get forty two thousand dollars james shared even more of the backstory things with matt didn't get ugly or involved in the legal system until angela was in the picture as soon as they had married Anne claimed the new couple had become obsessed with getting full custody of alice It started by disagreeing with Anne that Alice should be spending more time with her maternal grandmother. Then they made a legal filing requesting the full custody, even saying Anne was an unfit mother in a CPS report. Because of this, a caseworker was assigned to the families. Part of the process for deciding custody included a home evaluation. Was the child's home safe, clean, so on? This was not an issue for Anne. Her daughter had her own bedroom, she had toys, food, clothing, and put everything into her daughter's happiness. Angela and Matt's home was a different story. Now, I'm a level two hoarder, and I don't judge a mess, but let me tell you, when photos of their home popped up, I had a visceral reaction to the clutter. I mean, I'm a messy bitch in all of the ways you can be one, but this had me literally gasping. The living room had multiple chairs throughout it, all of which had piles of stuff on them. There were random shelves throughout the room, a lot of furniture, a hallway that was only half usable as stacked on one side were a bunch of Rubbermaid storage containers. At the kitchen counter, or possibly even blocking some of the entrance to the kitchen, was a long, large dresser. At the end of that, overtaking the living room, was a five-foot-tall, what looked to be maybe a ferret cage. I'm surprised they even let him keep his weekends. Uh, Yeah, no kidding. On top of the kitchen cabinets, there was a bunch of random stuff. You know, that place that's usually reserved for decorative baskets or wines or signs about Tuscany. But they just had boxes of stuff. In one of the bedrooms, there wasn't much room on the floor for more clothes, and there wasn't room on the bed for a person, as it, too, was stacked with clothes and hampers. In my non-expert opinion, I would say they were level four hoarders. Level four includes having an excessive amount of pets or waste, clutter preventing entrances to stairs, rooms, or exits, expired and or rotting food, and someone at this level should seek professional help from both cleaners and counselors. 
It wasn't difficult for the caseworker to find that Matt and Angela's home was unfit for Alice, let alone the three other kids that were there. This was a big decider in the custody battle. There were other concerns about Angela and Matt's relationship with each other and towards Alice. Things became more contentious when Matt suddenly claimed to have remembered that he had been a victim of Anne's emotional abuse and didn't want to be alone with her. No evidence was ever found to support this claim. After Matt claimed abuse, Angela became more involved in the custody exchanges. He then stopped paying the child support. Then there was the interview conducted by a family counselor. She needed to speak with Matt and Anne, asking Angela, the new wife, to excuse herself to a different office. This caused Angela to cry and beg to be allowed back in the room as she needed to be there to protect Matt from Anne. This, again, was due to those abuse claims. Even though that claim had been made, Matt didn't appear to have any issue with the meeting. The counselor's findings were that she was concerned, and when Angela was hysterical, Matt appeared to defer to his wife. Anne was getting sick and tired of the bullshit. She emailed friends saying how Matt was becoming antagonistic and uncooperative. Going on, she said, quote, I just cannot comprehend what I did to deserve this level of shit in my life. I am so done dealing with this shit. Besides not having his daughter around, there was another reason Matt was upset about losing the case. Money. And not just what he owed in back payments or lawyer's fees. Anne had been working full-time to care for Alice. Matt and Angela were both unemployed, although they referred to themselves to the police as professional parents. They were living on just $2,000 a month in government checks. Which, let me say, is totally fine if you have no other choice. If you need help to keep your kids fed because you work two jobs and you still can't cover your bills, get that money. If you're two able-bodied adults that just can't hold a job because you'd rather be playing video games, that's a different story. For the record, about 65 million Americans, or 19%, receive benefits like SNAP or Social Security. Of that 19%, 15%, or just shy of 10 million people, have been proven to be involved in fraud. So it's not the lowest number, but it certainly isn't abused by a majority of users. The other 85% of users genuinely need the support and use it correctly. Angela and Matt fell in the latter category. They had found it was easier to get small checks for their kids than to get better money by working. The only catch was that they weren't just getting support and using it to care for their children. They were using their kids to get bigger checks. Missing out on more custody of Alice meant less money for Angela and Matt. Were they really disabled? Well, let's talk about that. Mm, I knew it. An aspect that did make the family more money was the gaggle of disabilities they were facing. When her daughter Emily was younger, Angela took her to see a counselor. Instead of Emily sharing what was going on, Angela spoke for her and started telling wild stories of Emily's behavior, which according to Emily, never happened. Because of this fabrication, Emily was prescribed medication. The two younger boys were also given the same treatment, taken to different doctors and counselors. Angela gave details of behaviors and symptoms. The kids were then prescribed meds. In fact, it was her Munchausen by proxy that had ended her marriage to Aaron. He knew the kids weren't sick or mentally unwell. He knew they weren't bipolar or autistic or ADHD or OCD or anything of the like. But there they were, being given medication for those diagnoses and bigger checks to support them. That is horrendous. After Angela and Matt were wed, there was a new diagnosis, that Alice was bipolar. But for anyone who had been around Alice or worked with her at school or knew her in any setting, wholeheartedly disagreed. Luckily, Angela couldn't get any other doctors or caseworkers to agree with it either. To everyone aware of Angela and Matt's situation and her little stunt with Alice, it seemed her kids were all okay, but the parents knew how to manipulate the system. That may sound ridiculous, and awful beyond comprehension, but those people do exist. I've met them. I've seen kids in foster families that were only taken in because of the checks. I've seen parents ask about getting more diagnoses for bigger checks. I've heard families upset when their child was taken away or out of foster care because it meant no more checks, all of which is not only disgusting towards the child, but it paints a bad picture against those who legitimately need the financial support to meet the needs of their child. And as they can tell you, it rarely covers the cost. Just six months before Anne's death, a final ruling in family court came in. Anne was granted full custody of Alice. Matt did not react. Angela, though, started yelling, screaming, and cursing at the courts. 
Going home, Karina was speaking with Angela when she said, if I kill her, no one will miss her, the her being Anne. Karina knew her friend was just upset and blowing off steam, so she let her vent. Still not willing to pay child support, Matt lost his driver's license. And not long after that, the bill grew to a sufficient amount that warranted a warrant being issued for his arrest. Detectives couldn't help but see the motive presented by Matt and Angela, but without any witnesses or concrete evidence, they had no case against them. But they had the car on video. Couldn't they, like, get a warrant to search their car? It wasn't enough to show. It just happens. They're right. On paper, that's a coincidence. Ugh. There are probably a lot of white Mazda SUVs around here, and you can't say that that would be them when you can't even see the license plate. It was now time for Anne's funeral, and it was swarming with police. Just like in the movies, they had multiple officers in the funeral home and out in the parking lot, hoping the killer might show up or that someone would say something. With cameras rolling, officers watched on as Anne's family and friends mourned her. One detective was lucky enough to get a seat right next to Angela and Matt. No surprise there were empty seats around them. Anne's family had felt that they had been involved to some extent, and it pained them to see Alice held in the arms of her father and stepmother. Was that officer undercover? Yes. Ooh. Yeah. So everybody inside was undercover. Dream job. I know. And I do, and I think even in the parking lot, they I don't know that I saw explicitly, but I think even in the parking lot they were undercover as well. And so they were taking video and pictures and oh I know. Okay, go sit in that funeral and listen for stuff. Just <gasps> eavesdropping for a job oh sounds amazing. God. And tattling, hello, my two favorite things. <laughs> my God. The officer next to Angela noticed something that hadn't been seen in the previous interviews. On the top of her hand, in the webbing between Angela's thumb and index finger, was an inch and a half long cut. Mm -hmm. Detectives' eyes had, up until then, been pretty focused on Matt. Now they had to wonder if Angela could have also been a participant. She sounds like she's capable. Mm. Yeah, if you can do that with your kids. If you have an upcoming summer trip abroad, my go-to travel hack is Babbel. Whether you're a seasoned traveler or embarking on your first adventure, communication is key to fully experiencing a new culture. That's where Babbel comes in. Babbel is the language learning app that has sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, there's still time to learn a new language before you reach your destination. Babbel is perfect for people like me who may struggle with a short attention span with lessons that only take 10 minutes to complete so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Right now, get up to 55% off of your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash rain. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash R-A-I-N for up to 55% off of your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Getting Anne's autopsy results, detectives were horrified at just how brutal her murder was. From head to toe, Anne had been stabbed at least 60 times, perhaps more, but the wounds were too difficult to decipher from one another. Her hands were basically destroyed with cuts down to the bone from defensive wounds. All of her vital organs had been pierced. Her lungs suffered multiple injuries. The most shallow stabs were only a half inch deep. The worst went as far as eight inches. Oh, my God. Even more shocking was the timeline. With the screams the neighbors heard and the call to 911, they realized her attacker had been stabbing her throughout that four hour duration. In that time, Anne had been stabbed in the back at least nine times, her shoulder blades suffering the most trauma, one area of six and a half inches by six and a half inches, going from her shoulder blade to her flank and rib cage, had five wounds, averaging three inches deep. The cheek on the left side of her face had been lacerated four times, the cuts going an inch deep. Her right cheek had a three-inch long cut going through it. There was a fourth of an inch cut of her tongue. Her upper lip had a through-and-through -through injury, creating a two-inch skin flap. There were two lacerations on the right of her neck that went from her shoulder to her ear. Her head had a laceration on the back left side. Two more horizontal lacerations went across the back of her neck, 
Those were three inches deep, and this had been the killer's attempt to decapitate Anne. On one of Anne's shoulder blades, VXV was carved into her skin. Perhaps that was done as part of the torture or as a signature marking, but the meaning was and remains unknown. There was also a theory that the carving was an attempt to throw investigators off the killer's trail, hoping maybe the police would think that that sign was done by someone in the occult or by a serial killer. This also painted a picture of emotion behind the killer. This was overkill and passionate and personal. Once again, all eyes were on the Hesters, especially Matt. The detective's skin was crawling when on June 16th, just a few days after Anne was killed, he received a call from an insurance agent. The agent had been alarmed when Matthew Hester called them to inquire about his ex-wife's life insurance. Oh my God. He knew it was worth $100,000 and he wanted to know how it worked to get the money when someone had died. What detectives had learned but did not share with Matt was that one, there were actually two life insurance policies and had one through work and a personal one. Altogether, they equaled about $125,000. Secondly, Matt had been removed from both. It was Anne's mother and Alice who would be the beneficiaries. That makes me so proud of her. Oh, yeah. Like, she knew. She didn't wait to change that. What a motherfucker. Plenty of evidence had been taken from the scene, but evidence doesn't equal culprit. Testing takes time. While detectives anxiously awaited results from the weapons that had been recovered from the scene— a small pocket knife, and two large kitchen knives that had been taken from Anne's own knife block, they did what they could with the other evidence. First, there was the shoe print. Anne was barefoot when medics arrived, so they felt certain it was the print of the killer. Searching their database, they found a shocking match. This wasn't some size 12 men's boot. On June 22nd, it was identified as a nine and a half women's Airwalk Myra boot. Calling around, they found the shoe was sold exclusively at Payless Shoes. Looking through the Hester's phones, officers found that Matt had sent Angela a photo of a coupon for Payless on November 8th. She responded by sending a photo of her own, two boot options she was choosing between. Showing the photo to a Payless rep, they were certain the photo had been taken at the Clackamas Town Center Mall location as it was the only one not to receive new carpet when the stores in the area were renovated. Oh, my God. I love the detail. This on is this. like real detective work. So yes. shout out to these detectives because they did do some real actual detective work here. Going to the store, it was clear the carpet matched the picture. They were even able. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too immature. Right, pause for laughter. They were even able to find the exact spot in the store where the photo had been taken. Adding to their evidence, detectives took a list of purchases from the store for the 8th and found only one pair of the boots had been sold that day. Running the credit card numbers, they found it had been Angela Hester who had bought the exact pair of shoes that matched the footprint. That is so good. Using the information from their phones and Google Maps, detectives combed through their records to create what their normal routine was, looking for anything out of the ordinary. It appeared when the family still lived in Portland, they had a pretty predictable routine. They would take the kids to school, pick them up from school, maybe go buy fast food, then go home. Except for a few other stops and locations, that was pretty much it. Then detectives spotted a very odd location that both Angela and Matt's phone had gone to. The pair had driven 60 miles from home, winding up at the Mount Hood National Forest. Wonder why they went there. Hoping to find something in the area which would allow them to connect Matt to Anne's murder, detectives went to the forest and set up a search area. Just 100 yards off the main road from where the phones had pinged, a white nine-and-a-half woman's Airwalk Myra boot was found lodged in a dam on the creek. There was Angela's murder boot just staring at them from a pile of sticks. Detectives then scored big with surveillance. Besides the one from across from the apartment, they had been able to trace the car backward. With video from main streets, they followed the white Mazda SUV as it went across town, eventually into neighborhoods, before it was shown via another home camera pulling out of the Hester's driveway. Putting together a sequence using nine videos in total, they were able to track the vehicle from the Hester home to Anne's apartment, both when it left at 11 and when it arrived back home shortly after 3. The biggest flaw, they still couldn't see a license plate or who had been behind the wheel. Ah. This may all seem like a slam dunk, but circumstantial evidence won't win you a court case. They still needed more. But then things got quiet. 
it wouldn't be until August of 2017 that DNA results would come in. Officers had been hopeful that because of the amount of blood and the commonality of a person who is stabbing someone also getting cut or injured, they would have the DNA of their killer on the knives. Unfortunately, the knives came back as only having Anne's blood on them. The blood on the knife block, however, was another story. That blood belonged to Angela McCraw Hester. Uh Uh-oh. That's right. Armed with an arrest warrant, police were able to track the couple down. Shortly after the murder, the family had moved to Pocatello, Idaho. Before making any arrests, they surveilled the couple. While doing so, they watched as Matt, who suddenly wasn't walking with a cane or even moving slowly, was easily carrying large items like Costco-sized water packages to their car with ease. Going to the couple's home on November 15, 2017, Angela was arrested for Anne's murder. She did not go peacefully. Yelling at the officers while in a bathrobe and pajamas, she (laughs) wanted to know why she was being arrested while saying she can't be arrested. She has kids. That's too good. Matt was also brought in, not on any charges, but for another round of questioning. No longer being casually interviewed, but now facing real charges, Matt's story changed. Don't they always? Awkwardly, he continued the I need a cane to walk thing even after they told him that they had been watching him and knew he could walk just fine. To quote the Queen of Dramatics, Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz, Matt folded faster than the closing crew at The Gap. (laughs) He really said that on television. That's great. You know how he said it, like, uh... They folded faster than the closing crew (sighs) at The Gap. (laughs) (sighs) Oh, Josh Mankiewicz. Matt shared that Angela had always hated Anne. She talked about killing her or having someone hurt her. He didn't ever take it seriously and wasn't really concerned. That is, until that night, the night of June 10th. He had been in bed, like he told them from the start. In this version, though, he did wake up around 3 a.m. when Angela jostled him, asking for help. Just like in her story, she did need help getting cleaned up, and they did shower together to do so. Only this time, instead of vomit, he was cleaning blood off of her. It was all over her clothing, deep in her hair. Not only was there clearly a third party's blood, but Angela was bleeding too. Matt was simply a dutiful husband, and he never asked how his wife was hurt or whose blood she was doused in. I'm really sure. He just washed her. That's right. He swore to the officers that he never once said, what the hell happened, when his wife showed up covered in blood in the middle of the night. He also shared that the following day, he cleaned the inside of their Mazda as there had been blood all over the steering wheel and dash. I just can't fathom getting woken up in the middle of the night and my partner in that scenario not asking what the hell happened. The only thing I could think is that he didn't want to know. Or, yeah, or she specifically said, you don't want to know, don't ask. Yeah, Or, or he knew. He's like, I know she went and killed her. I don't really want her to be dead. Because this is all Angela's obsession. You know, he wasn't the one so concerned with everything. I mean, was he scared of her, though? Like, maybe he was scared (sighs) of her. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. When authorities spoke with Angela, she, too, was suddenly in pain and unable to walk properly, contrary to everything they had seen during surveillance. As they spoke to her about what they believed to be her involvement in Anne's murder, she started to, subconsciously and vigorously, rub the scar on her hand, the same spot on her webbing that had been spotted at the funeral. And the video is very eerie. She's like, it's like a nervous habit at that point. And she's just rubbing, rubbing, rubbing. give yourself away, lady. Yeah, no kidding. Wrapping the conversation up, officers saw just how well-trained Angela had become. After using a cup for water and a tissue for her fake tears, she delicately picked up the cup and used the tissue to wipe the rim before throwing it away almost as though she knew she would not only be followed, but that those following her would be interested in acquiring some of her DNA. Armed with that story, the DNA, the surveillance video of her car, and the boot, authorities were able to charge Angela with Anne's murder. They did not, however, have enough to charge Matt. Happy to send his wife up the river, Matt had more to say about their involvement. He claimed to have never taken her threat seriously, but he also said that they had been having conversations about how they could hire someone to kill Anne. The first name that came to mind was Aaron McCraw. Oh, 
boy. Wanting to catch as many involved parties as possible, the police asked Matt to call Aaron right then, which he did. Aaron happened to be on the road with his new gal, and they were headed to Idaho to pick up his kids for visitation. Playing it cool, Matt, while on speakerphone, told Aaron how Angela had been arrested for the murder and that he was being looked at, so he wanted to make sure they had their stories straight. He asked Aaron about their conversations and his potential willingness to be hired. He had shot it down right away, claiming he told her from the start that he didn't want anything to do with it. He then hung up on Matt. In reality, Aaron had said it would take $15,000 for him to do it, and the couple simply did not have that kind of money. So they had to figure out a cheaper way to get her out of their lives. With Angela's arrest, authorities were able to seize their home computer, Google records, and phone history. And if that isn't enough to make someone not want to commit a crime, that to me is like worse than prison. Seeing your Google history? It's not even that bad, and I can say it's all work-related, but sometimes I get curious about other things. Oh, I am. I spiral, man. I look up weird shit. The other day it was butthole tattoos. Oh, my God. I don't need detectives asking me about why I'm looking that up. I'm just planning my future. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just saying, you know, think about that, guys. Before you commit a crime, they're going to look in everything. Or before you Google anything. Uh, Yeah, that's true. It's forever. I don't know. I have a little thrill. Like, I get a little joy wondering if someday they'll knock on my door (laughs) and I get to explain why I Googled something. Yeah, we're definitely on some lists. (laughs) On the couple's computer, they found several damning Google searches. They included, but were not limited to, life insurance, how custody and insurance works after a parent's death, how to improvise a firearm, switchblades, and how to make homemade chloroform. How to improvise a firearm? That's my favorite one, I think. I don't even know what that... I have a potato and I need to know (laughs) how to use it. Yes. Aaron was then brought in for an interrogation and polygraph. He passed and was released. He has claimed that the process of all of that was so traumatic that it gave him PTSD, for which he now takes medication. I could see that. Now, I'm not saying that can't happen. I know plenty of people that have PTSD for all sorts of reasons. And maybe, Josh, you can speak on this. There was just something about this group of people having every kind of ailment. Yeah. yeah there was definitely a theme. And They're not believable people. Yeah, yeah. He was completely not believable. Yeah. And Mankiewicz asked him, so they asked you questions just exactly like I'm asking you? Yes. But that gave you PTSD? Yes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it was a very calm. You could see the video. It was just an interview. Yeah. Hmm. Very calm. So. He's doing some shit. Or, or, or he was up to something and was more scared, mm-hmm. which made it terrifying for him. Oh, right. Yeah. He's, yeah. That too. We've talked about how interrogations and questioning can go very, very wrong. That's not to say it couldn't happen, but yes, there was a lack of sincerity. I see. A lot that. of con artistry yeah. across the board. Yeah. 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 Even though it appears Aaron was asked to do the dirty work but turned it down because they couldn't afford him, there is another theory that getting Aaron blamed for her death was part of their plan all along Ooh. as it would have eliminated one more parent from their custody issues. Two birds, one stone. Exactly. Or one potato gun. That's right. One improvised firearm. <laughs> Angela was arrested for murder. Matt was arrested for resisting arrest, but those charges were dropped pretty quickly. Meanwhile, investigators and the prosecution were anxiously waiting for one of the spouses to roll on the other. Who would say the other was the mastermind? Which of them would try to get time off their sentence by throwing the other under the bus? But it never happened. The charges were dropped, so Matt moved in with Angela's friend Karina. With all of the children now in foster care until the legal issues were cleared up, he was free to lounge in his chair and play video games all day. She said he was acting as though nothing had happened. Meanwhile, she was grappling with the fact that not only was her best friend being charged with murder, but she herself could have done more. She could have reported the threats if she had taken them seriously. And maybe she did sleep through the car starting, or perhaps Angela rolled it out of the driveway before leaving so that she wouldn't get caught. Hoping to make up for what she felt had been missed before, she started leaving her computer on and recording audio, just in case Matt slipped up. I like her style. I know. He never seemed to come out of a video game coma long enough to do so. Do you know if on the video there it showed the car leaving and and in what state it was? Yeah, so it's the video as it pulled into uh, and left the house. The video is kind of like, imagine like a T road. So there's the road that the Hesters are on kind of facing one way. 
and then this other road going the other way. The house with the camera is facing forward and the Hester's house is. So you wouldn't see it. Is at like two o'clock. So you can kind of see it. You can see it pull into that driveway, but it's not like at their house. But it's pretty clear it's there. Because of Matt's confession regarding the conversation with Aaron, police finally had something to go on. They could charge him with conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation of a murder, and hindering prosecution by cleaning up the blood from the car and giving a false statement. He pled not guilty and was facing eight and a half years. Angela was originally charged with aggravated murder in what the prosecution had hoped would be a death penalty case. She pled not guilty and those were the only words she was willing to speak when it came to the case. Neither party was willing to make a deal by giving up the other. Attempting to make a deal with Matt, his inability to tell the truth had the state taking the offer back. They could not trust what he was saying, so there was no deal to be made. Oh, that's embarrassing. Yeah. they Basically, they tried a few times, and they were like, the story keeps changing. We're not, we're not doing this. I don't know why I find that so embarrassing. Like if I were yeah. getting a deal, like that's yes. the last thing I'd want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, sorry. <laughs> You're just not trustworthy. You suck that much. You're so untrustworthy that yeah. we've made so many deals with these convicts. Yeah. With murderers <laughs> and psychos. But you. <laughs> You're the one that does it. <laughs> yeah. Prosecutors were hoping the extreme elements of Anastasia's death, including being tortured, would lead to a death penalty for Angela. That wouldn't happen, though, as the 2019 legislature narrowed the criteria for crimes that could face the death penalty. Her charge was then changed to murder in the first degree, and the death penalty was off the table. In November 2020, Angela entered a guilty plea, perhaps because her daughter Emily was begging her to do so, and she was sentenced to 25 years to life. She will be eligible for parole in 2042 when she is 60 years old, and her daughter Emily is no longer in her life whatsoever. Since Angela took a plea deal and never spoke of her side of the story, detectives were left to piece together all of the evidence to paint a picture of what they thought happened that terrible night. Leaving her home around 10.30 to 11 p.m., Angela and the white SUV made their way across town. She arrived at the apartments in Gresham around 11. She then climbed the fence at Anna's building and found or brought with her the cinder block that she placed under the window. Climbing up, she removed the heavy AC unit, placing it on the ground. With that out of the window, she was able to open it all the way and climb in, knowing full well Alice was sleeping soundly at her home and would not be in her room, so she could get into the house without getting caught. Walking into the living room, she found Anna asleep on her bed. Starting with the folding pocket knife she brought, she began stabbing her. Perhaps the knife wasn't doing the damage she had hoped, so she stopped and went to the kitchen. That was when Anna got up from the bed and tried to make it out the front door, but Angela stopped her. The massive amount of blood on the floor showed there had been another attack there. It seems pretty obvious what her motive was for killing Anne, but there has yet to be an explanation as to why she tortured her for nearly four hours. Because she's a psychopath, Yeah, maybe? and maybe just hated her that much. I don't know. Karina, her best friend, still visits her in prison. If she ever tries to bring up the reason, she'll probably die behind bars, away from her children. Angela simply says, I won't talk about that. It's between me and God. Nicole, Anne's best friend and business partner, shockingly has sympathy for Angela. She thinks that she was another victim of Matt's and was tricked or talked into doing this on his behalf. Except for somehow he got worse when he ended up with Angela. I I don't think so. I completely disagree with that. And again, I don't I don't know these people. She knew them, but it very much appeared. Matt didn't seem to have the energy to try to do this stuff. He wasn't trying to get fake checks or more checks. He wasn't taking kids to doctors. You know, he he wasn't saying he had been abused. He, he was, was just going along remem- with it. Exactly. Completely th- apathetic. Yes. And I think that was a perfect person for Angela because she needs someone to be able to manipulate and make it appear like she's a victim. As for Matthew Hester, he took a plea deal in August of 2021. He was charged with and pled guilty to solicitation and hindering prosecution. The conspiracy to commit murder charge was dropped and for good reason. If evidence is ever uncovered that shows that Matt had more involvement Mm -hmm. than what has been found, he can then be charged with Anne's murder. If they had charged him with the conspiracy charge, it would have been double jeopardy if they had found evidence later. He was given a total of 56 months or four and a half years. 
Having been arrested in 2019, it appears he was given time served after entering his plea. He was set to be released on parole at the end of March 2023, which is, you know, right now. But as I tried to find him in the system, it appears he may have already been released. So be on the lookout for this guy. He'll probably and hopefully just rot in his little video game chair and no longer get into toxic, murderous relationships or create any more humans. Matt and Angela divorced after they were each sent away. The children remained in foster care. It took years of court battles, but eventually Alice, who is now 10, was given to her maternal grandmother. During the sentencing, Anne's brother, Nathaniel, gave an impact statement on behalf of the family. Part of it said, It goes without saying that the murder of Anastasia Hester has affected her family to a great and severe extent. The emotional and psychological turmoil has been truly devastating. I won't grow old with my sister and reminisce. She won't see her daughter grow up, get married, have kids, or be a grandmother. Multnomah County Deputy DA David Hannon said, This case involves a home invasion, and in that home invasion, in the darkness of night, Anastasia Hester endured devastating brutality that no one would want to imagine, let alone endure. But throughout this entire process, no one provided a bigger voice for Anastasia than her family. That's a tough one. Yeah. The, like, pure violence, like, that is not often that we hear Mm -hmm. uh, a body is found in that condition. Yeah. It's just hard to understand. And the fact that she was able to still call 911, that for four hours, yeah, she's bleeding to some degree and in pain and in shock. And they even ask over the phone there, like, do you know who it was? Could you see who it was? And she couldn't say. So I don't know. If Angela was wearing a mask Probably or something. She, oh, gosh, she didn't know who it was. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, for That's four horrendous. hours. I mean, that just goes to show how sick and horrible Angela is. Truly a monster. willing to drag it out that long and just make someone suffer. Yeah. I think Matt is just a scummy piece of shit kind of guy and didn't do anything to try to stop it. Didn't call it in when she came home bloody. Didn't report her threats or didn't try to but that he wasn't actually involved in the yeah but she is the you know to take your kids to the doctor so that you can put them on unnecessary medications so that you can get more money from she's okay with torturing people and making other people hurt so she can benefit from it it's horrible yeah and then to to think that that's the best outcome to be like well we'll just get her out of our lives and then we can have this kid never and never once in anything that i read or saw was there ever a point of she just loved being a mother so much or she loved having Alice around so much and she couldn't bear sharing no, her. she didn't. The she kids didn't. were a means to money yep. for her. She was greedy. Yep. And she wanted to prevail against her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she to wanted to win. destroy her and, yeah, and win. Yeah, and I think, and, and you could kind of see that. I know it's just pictures and, and, you know, sometimes some videos on stuff, but... Anastasia did have just this brightness and light and she had purple hair and this big, beautiful smile. People liked her. Yeah. And you could see that she was really living her life. She's going out and meeting people and she's dating and she's having fun as a pirate and she's doing all this stuff. And then here's Angela, who has, you know, a house full of people and kids that who knows how she really felt about them. So I think there were those elements there of I don't know if it's jealousy specifically, but um yeah, I I, 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 want, I want to win because I want to be better because yeah. she's the best. She's the mom. She's the good mom. I'd like to see uh, a psychological profile of yeah. her, but I I don't think I'd be too surprised. No, by it. I, I think it'd be interesting to be like, what was your childhood like? Like, was your mom also Munchausen? Did something happen? Like, I just I will never understand. Uh, well, literally any any of her thoughts. Any of the thought process. Well, she's definitely where she belongs. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. When your own daughter is like, yeah, she needs to be there. And what a great example of police work done right. Correct. It is frustrating that the testing takes so long. Yeah. That is what it is. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, they really did detective work. Yeah. It's nice to have a case like that. We're going to comb through the phones. We're going to create maps. We're going to watch you on video we're gonna go to clackamas town center and find the exact <laughs> spot where the photo was taken we had to go to Clackamas. they probably didn't need to do that but they yeah, certainly but they did. did wow yeah. yeah so yeah definitely kudos to them on the gresham police i would be shocked if matt ever had to face anything i don't think there's enough anywhere and i honestly think i think it's how it, he said it played out i think they tried to hire aaron mccraw and they couldn't afford it 
And then she just decided to do it herself. And he just didn't stop her. I don't I don't know that he even had the energy to uh, try to talk her into it. You know, she seems so uh, gung ho on it anyway. So I would be surprised if he ever gets charged again. But we'll have to wait and see, I guess. My bladder and my butthole. More than 17 years ago, we watched Drumline. <laughs> In the massage room. Yep. <laughs> Halftime is game time. You knew us well. You know what we were like back then. <laughs> Was. I'm almost there. I'm oh, almost hello. there. Oh. Oh, wait. Wrong. Ow. Okay. That's not how it works. I know. I had the wrong way. You know, my bulbous <laughs> thumb. It's oh, my a God. Hole. How does your thumb fit? You use your forefinger. Use your narrow forefinger. I don't even know. To push something? Well, Absolutely not. Your thumb might get stuck. Well, it might. <laughs> See? It's stuck right now. Currently actively stuck. It's fine. I'll just bury it in there, and then I get it. Just leave it in for the duration. <laughs> you see me next week. It's still there. <laughs> kind of crusty go. around the edges. So he's missing a toe and you end up missing a thumb. <laughs> no, I'm not missing a thumb. I have the addition no, of a clicker. No, they have to take it off because it cuts the it's circulation. Permanently... Also, my toe is not missing. I know where it is. <laughs> is it in a <laughs> jar in... under your bed? It's in heaven. Yeah, it's been incinerated and the ashes flew up to God's yeah. right hand. That's bullshit. It's my thumb, my body, my choice. June 10th, 2026. Nope, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I just sat here going, that doesn't sound right. This is a future crime. Welcome to Minority <laughs> Report podcast. This is Minority Report, <laughs> where we predict the crimes you're going to commit. Okay, some woman will be home alone, and some white man will follow her home, and... Surprise, we're the precogs. <laughs> Josh is over there in his little bath. Uh, 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 <gasps> that's right <laughs> don't wake me do I hear a mower yeah I hear something it's motherfuckers it's dad season uh, white new balances not wanting to follow in her parents fuss- footsteps. footsteps look out for my footsteps watch out my footsteps are you indeed. trying to follow in my footsteps those are Jesus that's Jesus on next the beach bitch footsteps <laughs> When there was only one, that was, that was Jesus carrying me. He carried me on the sand. This way. Footsteps on the beach. Such idiots. The dumbest things are funny to us. But that's what I love. That's my favorite part of this. That's why we walk in each other's footsteps. Hey, Leash, can you go back a few footsteps? <laughs> and start over? <laughs> I was just, that's the one, yeah. That's, 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 that's the word. <laughs> Not footsteps, but resets. I told you it would work. I told you. It's true. She did. She did. I should always follow her footsteps. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll try it out. Who knows? Please. But, yes, go be a third. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just feel like that I couldn't do that. My personality type might be might not be the third people want. But what if it's perfect because then you don't have to deal with like a full on relationship. You're just a, like the other relationship. Just a or sex hole. No, that's true. <sighs> and one time I was on a dating app and I learned that my hottie doctor was in oh, the polyamorous yeah. really, And I tried really hard to get a call back on that one. <laughs> but, I uh, made an appointment. You, did audition, you, I... <laughs> you gotta get something going on. <laughs> We need it. We got to hear some stories. That's right. I'll start dating sooner in this or later. Dry, in this... <laughs> it's spring. <laughs> uh, spring's almost yeah. here. I feel yeah. like I, I usually oh. go on a few dates in the spring. What if it's so good that it hurts, though? I don't want to hurt you. Oh, I thought you meant for you. I I'm like, then that's you. great. Yeah. No, no. I'll little, be fine. Trust me. A little road rash the next day. <laughs> I'm, I'm walking like a cowboy. That's what I'm talking about. You look like the William Peterson on CSI. <laughs> that dude's bow-legged. Where's some uh, yeah, jingle mosey, jangles? Please mosey in. Chung, like a cowboy, baby. The top rope back and, and the, the sunshine shining. shining. Yeah, he's like a really nice guy. Yeah. I, I can't imagine people like teasing him. No. Well, I just did. <laughs> but you but you haven't met you haven't met him. To have everyone's needs met. Mets. Mets. <laughs>
Everyone's is needs is is Matt's is is. <laughs> Even though Matt and Anne's. Uh, <laughs> I have a sneeze that's waiting to be born. Woof. <laughs> it's a boy. It's piercing. <laughs> Come and knock on our door. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. Where the kisses are hers and hers and his three's company too. Subsex. Oh. I mean, yar. Pillage that booty. Plunder. That's the word I was looking for. Pillage works too. Oh. Two was stacked with clothes and hamster. Hamsters? <laughs> I mean, so many hamsters, guys. Going to the couple's home on November 15th, 2000. Home. Oh, did I have a. <laughs> going to the couple's home. A little they weird. followed the footsteps back to their home. <laughs> he never once said, uh, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? <ha-ha-ha-ha. laughs> he didn't say it. Where are your footsteps? <laughs> Almost as though she knew that she would, uh, what? <laughs> Happy to send his wipe. Wipe. <laughs> Are you a Charmin bear? <laughs> oh, no! And hadn't wanted to have, and hadn't wanted, wanted, haven't wanted. Who would try to get time taken off their sentence by throwing the, un- damn. Onions. The onion under the bus. Until the legal systems, mm-mm. Mm-mm, no. <laughs> I beg to differ. The conspiracy charge would have led to jump, oh. Double jeopardy? Yep. Been a while. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>